Hello, it's David from David Savory Electrical Services Limited, and just a few days ago I put together a head throbbing video with four reasons why LED lamps continue to glow when they're supposedly switched off. At least my head was throbbing, although that was admittedly entirely self inflicted, so withhold any sympathy you may have had, and let's trawl through the comments and suggestions of alternative and, yes, I'll admit it, perhaps even better ways to crush capacitive induction using things other than neon indicators, which was my solution last time, although this does remain a viable option, so don't piss your underpants if you already used this method out in the past week. To very quickly recap, my LED lamp here is all aglow when it's supposed to be off, simply because the voltage on a neighbouring energised circuit serving just this socket outlet has created an electric field which is allowing a small current to pass, and this is down to the way the wiring of the two circuits has been run inside this fat plastic box here. This can be a common fault on switch drops on older installations which tend to contain no neutral and sometimes even no circuit protective conductor to suppress the electric field surrounding the line conductor. If you haven't already seen my last video explaining all this, then what the ruddy hell are you doing viewing this one? Go tune into that and then come back to this one, otherwise the continuity will be all to cock. I showed in that last video that the voltage induced by the capacitance was quite variable depending on what meter was used to read it. My TIS clocked in 99 volts, my Klein around 70 volts, my Mega 3 volts and my Metro 23 volts if memory serves right. There was a question about the highest result perhaps being the better i.e. more sensitive meter. Well my thanks to Steve from the SDG Electronics channel who was the first to point out that digital multimeters have a high impedance to allow for electronics work while an MFT will have a low impedance to squash stray voltages such as this. And a good thing too, for as an electrical installer I might shit my trousers if I connect up my MFT and read a hundred volts or so on the line it would have me questioning the effectiveness of my isolation and scratching my thatch as I attempted to interpret what was happening. I'd have to poke the wire into Nigel's buttocks to see if he jumped up in the air or not in order to know whether it's just a ghost voltage or if it's actually got any proper wallop behind it. Alternatively, the 3 volt or even the 23 volt readings I saw on my Mega or Metro respectively would just see me royally waving a dismissive hand and cracking on with the job of course. Interestingly, MONKEY pointed out that my TIS E217, which I used to read the 99 volts across my lamp last time, has itself got a dual impedance input. Now uh, that's very interesting that, we'll have a closer look at that. This is a new instrument to me and I've got no manual for it. I've barely had time to look at the feature set yet and I just put it out of the case for the last video. We can see our lights glowing there so let's switch that back to volts as we had last week and we'll turn on the rather nice backlit display. And if I put it across line and neutral here and like last week, we can see that the uh, the light is shorted out, it doesn't illuminate anymore, and we're reading 100 volts uh, still across there. About the same as it was, I think we had 99 last week. I'm quite surprised at that, actually. I thought it might have been a little bit better because the wires have all been shoved back into the plastic box now. They're not quite as separated out as they were, although the two circuits are still running alongside each other. But, uh, oh, there we go. Yeah, so we're on about, we're on about 100 volts, aren't we? across line and neutral for our nuisance glow. However, if I switch it to the low impedance input, which I hadn't even spotted was there, and once again put this display on, we can see that it now only reads 7.9 volts. So being able to switch between the two is a rather handy feature, depending on whether you want to be measuring these sort of rogue voltages or to discount them. Clever stuff. In the previous video I showed a neon indicator such as this which is easily obtained and can be used to uh, mop up the stray current that would otherwise be causing the LED lamp to nuisance glow. The neon itself uh, it soaks up the, uh, the capacitive current there and glows dimly and when the power is applied to the light it glows brighter but it's easier to conceal this thing and it does the job of mopping up that stray current. Again, Steve at SDG Electronics was quick to mention the use of a capacitor instead, and he named the Danlers Capload as an albeit marked up product packaged for ham fisted installers. Well, that sounds ideal for myself and Nigel, but at the best part of a fiver, it does seem a little bit steep for what is effectively just a capacitor with insulated legs. But at least you can get them at CEF, uh, albeit probably via a web order rather than over the counter, and it comes ready to fit with no pissing around.
Sticking with capacitors, there were several mentions of such as a solution, but besides Steve pointing to an actual product, my thanks go to YouTubers CrazySparky63 and DD313Car, who listed suitable values as did Graham Langley. You can't just stick any old capacitor onto here, and they all mention the X2 cap of about 0.1 microfarad, and Graham notes how such can be foraged from switch mode power supplies if you want to be a scrounger about it. Graham also raised the concern that a failing neon can be messy. Neons do get darker over time, which is down to the metal from the electrodes becoming deposited on the glass. This is something I can kind of demonstrate. I have two neons here bought from Maplin at the same time in the early 1990s. The one at the bottom of the screen was used on a project that saw it constantly illuminated for more than 10 years. The other has seen comparatively little use. It's a bit tricky to pick up on camera, but hopefully you can tell that the one at the bottom of the screen, which has seen the higher use is of a lesser brightness than the one above it. Eventually metal from the electrodes can bombard the inside of the glass bulb quite badly causing it to blacken over time. Graham says that in a worst case these metal deposits can short and cause the series resistor fitted within the assembly to overheat with potentially scary results. Personally, I've never seen it happen, and these things are often employed as continuous power indicators for appliances switched on 24-7. Before LEDs, neons were commonplace on equipment such as fridges and freezers where a visual indication was needed over a period of years, and where a small incandescent lamp would require more power and last a fraction of the time. You still find neons now on things like electric showers and in accessories such as cooker and shower isolators. These are things that you're used to leaving on day and night for years with no thought towards ill effects because we trust them to last and they generally do. Remember too that the neon itself will only be at full brightness when the light is itself switched on. So most of the time it's not even going to be at full brightness, so it's not running at full capacity 24-7 in this sort of situation. Personally, I have no qualms about using a neon in this application as they're cheap, easy to obtain, can be bought pre-wired for ease of installation, and will likely last the lifetime of the LED lamp you're connecting it across to stop a nuisance glow. That said, a capacitor may be a better solution as we shall see. And look, I happen to have an X2 capacitor right here. It was amongst various others already rattling around in my component drawers. This one is rated at 275 volts AC and 0.047 microfarad, and it has insulated leads. So is Bob on for the job? Let's try it. Let's put this in circuit then. We can see we've got our nuisance glow on our lamp. I did that last week as well. Right, we're going to stick that between there and there, and already I can see the lamp has extinguished as I push that wire into place. So there we go, our capacitor is fitted, uh, our nuisance glow is gone. Let's see what happens when we turn the light on. Marvellous. Well, no ill effects there, as you would expect. So, uh, not a bad solution. Now, if you can find one with insulated leads like this one's got, then uh, obviously it becomes easy to fit um, and it can go into place with no, no problem, no ill effects and no messing around. And it has two advantages over a neon. The first concerns insulation resistance. Gordon asked how a neon would affect IR testing. Well, a neon would act as a load connected between line and neutral. So if you want to IR test such, then you'll have to remove it along with any other load. That's if you know where to look for it, of course. You might remove the lamps from a downlight arrangement and wonder why your IR reading is still off, only to find someone fitted a neon behind one of the cans and didn't leave a note or label at the board stating where it was. To see how a neon affects IR, let's connect my Metrail MI3100S and perform an IR test at 500 volts. We can see the test current is enough to drive the thing, resulting in it lighting up and dragging our test reading down. Had we installed a capacitor instead, then the test passes with flying colours without the need to remove it from circuit. And that's because, as I said in the last video, a capacitor is a dead end to DC. A cap such as this should be able to take the DC your IR tester puts out. It is possible that surges on the supply can cause your cap to fail though, and an X2 cap may fail short circuit. I believe you can use a Y2 capacitor instead, which is designed to fail open circuit. I'll leave the electronics boffins to comment on that. 
Onto neutral IR testing is a bit of a funny one and on EICRs I often have it down as a limitation of lighting and socket circuits simply because it can either be difficult to track down all loads for an installation I'm unfamiliar with or it's just too impractical to remove them. Take a 12 volt downlight arrangement where behind every light fitting is a transformer connected between line and neutral which needs to be wired out for full IR testing. Removing each would be a ball pane so we IR with the switches off or limit line neutral IR testing altogether. And after all, it's really the insulation resistance between line neutral to earth that I'm interested in, as that's where poor readings start giving the RCD the friggin' arsehole. Initial verification is a different beast, of course, but then if I'm verifying a circuit I've installed, I should jolly well know where all the load connections are. The second advantage of using a capacitor over a neon is that there is no waste light. In terms of running costs, a glowing neon isn't going to trouble your electricity meter, but you are using the neon to mask the nuisance glow of the LED light, and in doing so you're creating another nuisance glow, albeit one that can more easily be hidden. But not making waste light in the first place is doubtless a better idea and saves Greta Thunberg some unnecessary loss of sleep over the wasted microamps. So for that reason, and for the IR thing, I'd say use an X2 capacitor rated above your territorial voltage in the first instance. Another option was suggested by Mr. Double Drive, the Bush and Jaeger 6596 Compensator, which rather impressively sounds like something out of Terminator 2, although it's a little eye-watering on the price. I don't know what's inside the package, but if it's a choice between buying this or using a cheap neon or capacitor and blowing the difference on guest ales and pork scratchings down at the dog and hammer, well, let's just say I know whose urinal I'll be taking a dark yellow thick piss into. By coincidence, when back at work this first depressing week of January, I picked up a copy of Professional Electrician magazine from the counter at CEF. Crikey, there's a rogues gallery. You wouldn't want to bump into this E5 crowd down a dark alley. This wild bunch look like they'd nick your dinner money and give you quite the robust wedgie in short order. I hope they're not put out by my image editing antics. They know I love them really, so uh, do check out their channels or link to in the description. Anyway, after you read E5's worthy article, on page 41 of January's edition, we find advertised a Time Guard product, the ZV900, designed to deal less with the capacitive problem and more with one of the other causes I mentioned in the last video, where a control current has to pass from a timer or smart switch through the lamp in order to get to neutral, which is inadvertently causing the bastard thing to light. The price is a little hairy, and I've no experience of the ZV900 myself, but if your nuisance glow is down to smart switches, then this thing may be worth a peek. Going back to capacitive nuisance glow, both Steve Perry and Capo Steve mention the use of resistors. I don't know, maybe it's a Steve thing. This is a 390k resistor rated at a quarter of a watt. So if we put that between line and neutral on our nuisance glow, then we can hopefully see it doing the trick of indeed shorting out the lamp and solving our little our little issue there and with the light circuit switched on fuck christ on a bike uh. It seems I bought 390 ohm resistors, not 390 kilo ohm resistors. Okay, interestingly, uh, what uh, what would that have been? 230 over 390. Oh, we just pumped over half an amp through my poor little resistor there. So, uh, what power would that have been? 230 squared over 390. 135 watts, just over 135 watts. So, uh, through my quarter watt resistor. No wonder there were fireworks. Uh, right, okay, let's see what other resistors we've got then. I do have another higher value resistor here. This one is a 7.5k at half a watt. And as you can see with it in circuit there, our nuisance glowing light has gone. And I should be able to fire this up now without any zappy fireworks. Oh, marvellous. Fishy smell. Oh, for fuck's sake. Oh, wait, 230 volts over 7.5 to the 3 is 30 milliamps uh, over 
which is seven watts on a half watt resistor. So effectively I've just made a little mini heater there. I really should do the maths before connecting these things up, I suppose. Oh well. This is the last resistor I'm going to piss around with today and it's the biggest value I've got at 560 kilo ohm. It's a quarter watt. This time I've done the mathematics and I know that it's supposed to be pulling about 0.41 milliamps or 410 microamps. Uh, the power on it is something like 94 and a half milliwatts and again this is a quarter watt resistor so it ought to be fine. Obviously it's a parallel load to the lamp. Uh, so whenever the lamp is on it's just sitting there drawing those uh, those few milliamps uh, and doing its thing but it shouldn't be getting hot it shouldn't be acting like a heater like our resistors earlier so uh let's uh, let's do the old touch test and do, and see if it is indeed warming up oh you fucker oh yeah <laughs> fucking power is on isn't it uh that was rather stupid of me um Always make sure the power is off if you're sticking your fingers anywhere near live parts. Interestingly, it, uh, it seems to have had an effect on the old chap downstairs there. Jesus, I haven't had a rock on like that for a while. It's, uh, I don't know how that works electrically or biologically, but uh, really impressive. Uh, with it off, I can tell you that, yes indeed, it's cool to the touch and uh, it ought to be perfectly fine there. So I guess uh, a high value resistor uh, would do the job. I said that this resistor connected in circuit like this will be drawing about 410 microamps or so according to uh, my Ohm's law calculations. That's obviously about 0.41 milliamps. So that's what we're going to be able to measure now with the TIS560 clamp meter, which I've got clamped around the feed to the motherfucker. So let's turn that on. And obviously we're going to take the lamp out of circuit because we don't want that to be skewing our readings. And on the display of the clamp meter, sure enough, I'm getting 0.47 milliamps, 470 microamps. Near as damn it, isn't it? With or without the lamp, you've, you've got this resistor in there and it's drawing that small amount of current uh, all the time that the light is on. So uh, we're burning power for no real benefit there. I also have some of these things, which are a ceramically cased snubber of some kind provided by a smart switch manufacturer after we had problems with their products a couple of years back. They're simply labelled as LED adapter, so I don't know what's inside. Resistively, it shows as about 15k and my ESR or capacitance testers can't get a figure out of it, so uh, it might just be a resistor in here. I've seen similar things as RC networks too, though. If we try it on our light, then it seems to do the job of squashing the nuisance glow. But again, the nice thing about this is that it's packaged and ready to go, unlike a common or garden resistor, which would have to be sleeved. Jesus, that's hot. Ooh, let's get a temperature read into that thing, shall we? I'll find out what's going on there. Where's my temperature probe? Uh... that onto that ceramic case. Look at that going up. 56, 58 Celsius and climbing. It's into the 60s. Well, and it's settling down at 68 degrees. In fact, it's still still going up a little bit even then. 68 and a half degrees. Uh, obviously, it's dissipating a bit of power through that. And I suppose if it's 15k, 15 kilo ohm, uh, squared over 15 to the 3, then that's a good 3.5 watts going through that, causing it to heat up. So uh, if, it's a, if it's a case of putting in a, um, a capacitor that loses nothing through heat, or a neon that only loses a little bit of power through light, or using this damn thing which sits there cooking away at the best part of 70 Celsius while the lights are on then uh, yeah I, I, I think I think these are going to go in the bin to be fair I don't think they're going to open their viable at all we've seen a resistor works as a solution if it's sized correctly in terms of resistance and wattage and I'm not saying 560k is a suitable value although it seems to be working for me here in this briefest of tests this ceramic thing which may be purely resistive 
uh, to around 15 kilo ohms certainly gets warm and we saw it get to around 70 Celsius earlier which is a bit horrendous and that makes me think that uh, obviously it's not ideal because there are losses here through heat if this is purely resistive then it'll be drawing about uh, 15 milliamps uh, and like the neon it will skew your line to neutral IR readings if you don't know where it's been placed I suppose as well with the neon you've got the glow of that so it acts as a visual warning that it's live and you shouldn't be sticking your finger anywhere near it unlike this resistor which caught me out earlier. So uh, I still think a 250 volt neon is a better and more convenient solution than a resistor like this. One last line on resistance and here we have a Danlas 10 watt device which reads as a load resistor with heatsink to augment small loads on dimmer switches. The ohmmeter clocks us in at 5.6 kilo ohm. And this can be used to address one of the other issues I described last week where the minimum load with LED lighting may be below that of a dimmer switch. But bloody hell, what a beast. I mean, you could conceal it behind a downlight or something, I suppose, but where else would you stick it? Don't answer that. It's got a date of 2014 on it, which indicates when I first got my wanking claws around the thing. And the fact that it's still here means that uh, I've never found a scenario where I figured it will do the business. We saw earlier how just a few milliamps of AC could uh, blow up my 7.5K resistor. And this uh, is even less at 5.6K, but uh, obviously it's got a, a higher wattage rating and is fitted with probably a beefy heat sink in here. Meaning I suppose that it's designed once again for energy to be wasted as heat. So uh, one could perhaps say that environmentally speaking, fitting this would be akin to punching a dolphin in the balls. If your dimmer and LED lamps are properly sourced and paired, and if any stray capacitance is stifled by either a simple low cost capacitor or a neon from last week, then there's no point to be burning electricity as waste heat with any kind of resistive load. Uh, besides, once again, your line to neutral IR is bollocks with this sort of thing in circuit, whereas a capacitor, as we've seen, is a better way to avoid losses and spurious IR test results. So there we are. Between this and the prior video, I've described why this problem may occur and I've given solutions around the four types of causes as I've seen them with valued feedback from the wider community. And my apologies to anyone who wasn't specifically mentioned who contributed to that discussion last time. Rest assured, I value your feedback even if I've not directly responded to it. I'm going to have to see if I can get the wife to do something about this damn thing. So uh, that's all for today and uh, thanks for watching. I say, darling, I don't suppose there's any chance of an old-fashioned getting that dribbling thing out of my ear, or I'll use my bonk-on spoon to knock it out. Mm. Yes, dear. <laughs>